Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Joshua Pentelaresco. I write stuff in podcast two, and this is episode 100, live from Woo! Owl's Nest Books in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And I want to, before we actually get to the actual to the show, I want to do a real quick thank you to Owl's Nest Books, especially to Sarah Johnson for putting up with me for the last few days. <laughs> uh, because I have been a nervous wreck, and I will be the first to admit it, because I have no clue what I'm doing. But as I actually joke, as I have joked with many of my friends and people I know, I have never let me not knowing what I'm doing ever stop me from doing whatever it is I'm going to do. And it's been that way ever since I was a kid. Um... I made the decision at 13 years old to be a writer. And that, and that seems like a very young thing to discover, knowing what you want to know. But I, I entered a contest once upon a time in London, Ontario, Canada. They have it, and they, they don't have it no more because they finally ran out. But they used to have a, a colonel, my name of Colonel Austin, would have a contest to write about Canadian history. And back then I wrote a time travel story. And I ended up taking third place in the, in the contest, which was really cool because most people did essays about Canadian history. I wrote about time travel, about Canadian history. And I've been writing ever since. I did my first novel in high school. Um, I, so that was my high school project, figuring out how to write a novel. I was a big flake in class as a result of this. <laughs> and I'll be the first to admit that now. But back then, this was, again, I, this is what I wanted to do. And I was going to teach myself how to do it. And everything I did in high school was to teach me how to do this. I, I learned how to do a comic script in communications class because I just all I did was draw storyboards even though they were stick figures that would revolt which is hilarious that I bring that up because something I'm going to show later brings that back to mind but um, I have been chasing my dreams since I was 13 years old and one of the things about me is all these a lot of my career I literally could sum this up as a happy accident in every way possible I ended up um just I started doing interviews after I was done high school. I started interviewing comic book creators because I love comic books, and anyone that knows me knows I love comic books. And um, and and the thing is, I, I got to interview some really cool people that there, and this and then that led to me meeting one of my heroes, and then I ended up working for one of my heroes in the middle of nowhere in Arizona at seven thousand feet up. Um, an accident, but it was something I just went with. I got my butt kicked. But in, in the best possible way, I learned a lot about who I was. I come back to Calgary um, just because it was not my first go around here, and I just keep going. Um, I ended up uh, accidentally publishing two books. Well, accidentally publishing one book. The second book was just a natural thing. And this podcast is also an accident. I, ended, I got a chance to interview Robert Sawyer, who I really enjoyed admired reading when I was a kid. And he just said, while we were being interviewed, the whole thing about podcasts. And it just clicked in my head. It's like, I have never thought about doing a podcast. And, but it was just one of those things in my head. It's like, why wouldn't I do a podcast? And the really interesting thing about that whole journey is, even though I'm not just Rob, a lot of people in this room I've interviewed for the podcast. Um, one of my guests, they're sitting beside me right now, Vanessa Cardaway, was one of the first people I was interviewed for con. Card, bleh, one of the first people I interviewed for the podcast. <laughs> this is lie, ladies and gentlemen, so I don't get to retake this one. But, uh, but I've also I've interviewed like the the, the coolest um, accident is I I'm, I oddly found myself uh, getting to a hundred episodes doing this, and I've met incredible people. Whether it's Robert Bose, whether it's Axel Howerton, whether it's my sister, whether it's Sarah Johnson, right? Whether it's Neil Enoch, whether it's Adam Drees. That was actually a very life-changing conversation I had with Adam. Not so much the podcast, but the conversation we had afterwards. Um, I've met some really incredible people. And not, no joke, I, I am stunned beyond belief that people want to take the opportunity to talk to me. Um, because I don't see that, like, like, I just do things. I don't see myself as a big deal or, or a big... I, I joke about being a big rock star, but I just, I don't. I just, I was really flat. I'm really genuinely um, just a guy that's been doing this for so long. And it's really cool to get this a chance to talk to so many good people. And, and I think that's probably the biggest blessing I could have ever hoped for. Um, and now here I am at episode 100. And I have a live audience. It's a small audience, but it's my audience, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but, 
it's like, wow, I mean, I did 100 episodes of this. And I can't believe it. And I'm still doing it. I still enjoy it. And, you know, it's so for everybody here. And this sounds like a big, long thank you. It really is. Thank you very much for attending this podcast. It means a lot. Um, so tonight, what are we doing? Well, first off, I have three guests. Guest number one, I've never actually interviewed on the podcast yet, officially one-on-one. Um, <laughs> Robert Bose. Robert Bose gave me one of the nicest compliments to my writing I ever heard. I did an IFLA meeting back in February, I think it was. And I read this crazy little story about a girl with a gun blade and, and a cowardly a coward, a cowardly dude. And he actually said to me, you write like Christopher Moore. I'll take that. It was one of the nicest compliments I've ever had about <laughs> my writing. Right? Because I was that would that that I never I never went for I was going for Dr. Seuss, but I'll take Christopher Moore. I'll, I'll totally, <laughs> totally, totally do that. Um, but the other, but then there's Axel Howerton, who's my second guest. Um, Axel is a one of a kind rock star in of himself. He writes, he publishes, he's a mus- he's a musician, he he organizes events, he does an incredible amount to the community, and it's again really, really, really a privilege um, just to have him here. And then my third guest, Vanessa Cardaway, may may be, and that's hard to say because there's a lot of people. She's one of the cleverest storytellers in music I've ever listened to. Um, she has incredible range, incredible talent, incredible drive. Um, and the fact is, and the thing that really amazes me about her, and I've said this on my podcast, is there's always music with her. Even when we talk, sometimes she'll go into song, and I don't even think she fully realizes it anymore. It's just who she is. And these are the kind of people I get to associate with on a regular basis. And I think that's just damn cool. All right, and I'm messing a lot of people here um, because truthfully, every guest, with one exception, uh, I will I will mention this now. My Star Trek guest was the weirdest experience I've ever had on the podcast <laughs> by a shot. Uh, um, but beyond that, um, uh, I've had some incredible people on the show, and it wouldn't have gotten to 100 without you. So thank you very much. I think I, I should be done with all the wonderful thank yous. Maybe I should actually get to the show here at some point or another. But I figured this is the 100th episode. I might as well get that long monologue in once. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start my first guest in the guy I have not interviewed before because I figured this might as well, I might as well get, get into people to know him a little bit better. Robert Bose, ladies and gentlemen. How you doing, man? Good. That's a really short answer to that. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, man. First off, congratulations. I see we, over there. If you guys got to take a look, there's an emblem of your. Is that your actual first like book with your like your full name on yes. that? Congratulations, man. That's awesome. But you've been writing for a long time, haven't you? For a long time. So Where did you get started with? Uh, back in. The D and D club in university back in about 1985, actually. That's really cool. So you writing you, for the newsletter we we did. That's actually that's actually really cool. So you were a bit, you were a big gamer then when you were in your yeah. younger days. You still game? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. Still D and D? Yeah. Once in a while. Fourth edition. Fourth edition. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so my gamer audience just like went like yes so in the eye. It's all good. <laughs> but uh, so but at this point you like you've done a, a, like I was looking I was trying when I was trying to interview you. You've done a lot of short stories. So what is it about short stories that actually appeals to you? Uh, being able to finish them. <laughs> <laughs> and I spend five years of my life. That, that, that's a really good reason not to, do, not to, <laughs> not to uh, go into longer forms. But uh, so just something that just came like while you were, like was it like initially like a gaming thing that led to short stories or was it something else? Well, I wrote a lot of gaming material in the 90s. And I wrote some, I wrote for uh, Hero Games a little bit and I, and I wrote a lot of, you know, like little snippets for modules and, and gaming modules and things like that, you know, and you need a page here or a page there that says, you know, the characters did this, the characters did that, so I've done a lot of that kind of thing. Yeah. But uh, then a few years ago, a friend of mine at work said, you should write about all your adventures that you do, like, I do a lot of running and mountain climbing and scuba diving and things like that, so I started writing kind of little memoir 2,000, 3,000 word little snippets. And those were fun, and I wrote like 20 or 30 of them, and then I went, I, they became more, I, I called them mostly true tales, 
because the more you you the more you tell them, the less true they become. Mm-hmm. And so these stories started to become more made up af- after a while, you know, because the, they're, they become memories, and you're just trying to trying to remember something that happened 30 or 40 years ago, and you just start throwing fantastical elements in it, and they become short stories essentially. Oh, okay. So, Bayer, so there's always a sense of like a, a, of an experience you've been in everything you've written. Yeah. It, well, those the the first, especially the first the ones. The first ones. Yeah. Now there's just whatever crazy whatever. So define crazy whatever. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I write a lot of. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call it uh, anti-religious stories, but I grew up pretty Catholic, so maybe a little more rebelling stories from. Catholicism. So a lot of my stories, my book is about uh, fishing with the devil, and uh, a lot of my stories are kind of a have a, you know, devilish bent. There's n- there's nothing <laughs> wrong with that. No, I, 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 I kind of understand. I, I only a little bit. Like I I lived in the Mormon community for two years. I that was shocking. I mean, and and it just because it was such a, a um, good people, but but by and large, like the the hardest thing for me was. I found that I, I had to be something I wasn't because it wasn't because it just it the culture there just I couldn't I still swore like a sailor there's a few Mormon ministers that gave me quite a few looks uh, and during my time there uh, there's a baseball story in particular that got everybody involved but I digress but the thing but the thing is it, it's um um but uh, I, I found like it's, it's just really hard so if you're around a community that's so strongly in, ingrained in something, it's really hard to be yourself. So, it's not that strange or that wrong at all, really. Yeah. So, and my and the book came from and the, and the story that kind of anchors it is a, a story about my grandfather, really. So, oh. when I was young, my grandfather was such an evil, evil man. So, <laughs> he took me fishing a lot, and and he was my family was very Catholic, but he wasn't religious at all. Okay. So he's the kind of guy that would show up at a family gathering with 50 people and he would say, he would pull out the encyclopedia and he would show everybody a picture of an ape and he'd go, that's Moses, just so everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to hang out with him. So I'd, my parents would give me one side of everything and he would give me the other side. So he's kind of like a balancing act for yes, you. Yes, and yeah. I always thought, and I was thinking of a story and uh, I was thinking... My grandfather is the devil, like, and a story just completely popped right out of it. And then after I wrote that, I started writing more stories like that, and and uh, that book has a lot of them in it, actually. Actually, I I, I might want to read that book. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. That's actually awesome. Although I I I have, I have found like with my own experience is that sometimes angels and devils are not necessarily what you think they are. And, and that sometimes the devils in your life are actually the angels, and that the angels are sometimes they're the, they're they're the devils. So because again, appearances more than anything else can be deceiving. And your grandfather sounds like a hoot. I I, I, I really I really I really want to go to a party with him just because that'd be hilarious. But uh, but no, that's really that's really cool, man. So are you ever going to do a long form story? Or are you content? Yeah, I, I've written a few novels now, but I'll actually get one finished. And that's good. One of these days. Yeah. So it's just it's more like you're more you're more at this point into just getting your short stories out there. Or is that more yeah. more comfortable my with next, that? My next project is finishing my book. So if anybody's read uh, AB Negative, the, the book that Axel put out, I have a story called Dead Reckoning in it about a supernatural detective. And my story, my book is that character. Oh, that's and it's cool. mostly dead now. I think I should be able to get it done this year. So that's awesome. That'll be my next project after. Yeah. Coffin well, Hop well, has. Well, 4,000 things. 4,000, yep. 4,000? That is Axel, ladies and gentlemen, just in case you want to... We'll let Axel talk about all the uh, yeah, uh, crazy cop and hop stuff. That, but no, that, that sounds like really cool. Congratulations. Now, I, I, I brought. I mentioned this to the beer. Would you actually like to read something at this point in time, or would you... What would you rather... What would you want to do? I didn't actually give it. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely... See, I, see I, I, so in the email, ladies and gentlemen, I actually requested that the authors and... It would bring something to read because I figured it was a good way to introduce them. But since that's not the case in this case, <laughs> oh, oh, wait, did we wait. bring a copy of? Do we yeah. have a copy? No, of? but I, uh, I'm sure I have it on my iPad. That's nice, right. that's right. <laughs> Yay, technology! Yay, life. This is live. <laughs> you're, you're not getting away with not 
not reading. Yeah. I can read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> yeah, do we have a copy of my... Uh, yeah, you probably do. Eh? Yeah. You want uh, Fishing with the Devil? Sure. Yeah. All right, we'll keep talking because it'll, it'll okay, take five so, so Okay, so while, 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 he, while this slows us, okay, while we're, while we're sorting this stuff out. So, if, so beyond, beyond that, um, beyond, so what, where have you been published? Like, a, like, like you have a, a significant list, but is there anywhere where people can find you regularly? You can I don't know regularly, but uh, uh, I've been in the uh, Enigma Front books, and we have a new one of those coming out. What? August. August. And he fails to mention that, that uh, the title story was a finalist in the Robin Harrington Memorial Contest two years ago. Yes. So it's okay. We all saw our slip shirt, dude. I did that very beginning of the very long monologue. It's all good. But, <laughs> but. And then I had a story uh, called uh, Adergatis, which is about Syrian sea goddesses in uh, Nevermore, which was actually really cool. That sounds really cool. And that was an anthology Edge did a couple of years ago that had Margaret Atwood in it and Kelly Armstrong and all the real famous people. Yes. Uh, Tanith Lee and things. Anyways. Cool. You know which one was original. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, folks. So that was really good. Actually, that kind of helped me meet a lot of people. Before that, I didn't know tons of people. But getting to know uh, Nancy Kilpatrick uh, really kind of she, opened doors for she's a to me to meet a lot of people. And then once I met a lot of people, I ended up getting lots of other short stories published. And, I, I, and yeah, so. I, I believe it. I mean, I, I, I just it, it's it's one thing because I, I met Nancy not too long ago. Actually, she, she was the second hardest interview I ever had on the podcast because every time we went to talk, the power would go out. Like the power would go out, the phone would disconnect. She is the most anti-technology person I've ever been around in my life. She's cursed, I think. Yes. <laughs> Probably. I would not be surprised one way or the other on that one. But uh, beyond that, how can people find you Like, if they want to contact you? Just on Goodreads. Yeah. On Amazon. Twitter? And Twitter and Facebook. And at, at Robert Bose on Twitter? <coughs> uh, Rob Bose. Rob Bose? Okay. So there we go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to turn it over to Rob here to actually read from... All right. Dead air. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, hit the ambiguous button. Dude. It, it, this, it's ca it, it's called the edit button. I got this wonderful thing where I can I'm take so dead air no, and no, cut no, it. No, <laughs> <laughs> This this live. Live? Live? We're I, I am. I'm a shameful man. Now I have to leave this in. <laughs> this is why. This is why I fill the air with my evil ways. This is the technology pause. Yes, this is right. This is the technology pause. All these powers isn't going out. There we go. Don't jinx it. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Yeah. So, so, so now tell our listeners how the weather is, Josh. So, so, so here's the thing. So we have a. We have. We had. A, a very brave group of souls. So when I made the cake, I was like, "Yes, these people are going to come. It's going to be amazing." Mm -hmm. And then I watched, look outside, <laughs> and I watch, I watch the trees bend. I'm like, "That's not normal." <laughs> and uh, and I, so once upon a time, I lived in a spot where that was normal, but I don't live in that right now. And then I saw rain, and I saw little things of snow, and I'm like, "So everybody is going to bail." That said, I'm not going to be here. And yeah, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go against the cyclone tonight. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's right. Just a small monster. Hey, listen, it's okay. I, I, it's Calgary cyclone, one on one. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I sense a story coming. Up. <laughs> the apocalyptic hundredth episode. <laughs> that's really, it's, it's really, it's really what this is. Is the apocalyptic one zero zero, where it's like, I yeah, get to one hundred and just it's so the world has to end. Starts in the nest, ends in Oz. Yes. <laughs> Rock the sea, the wizard, the, the wonderful wizard. Of anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a Don't. sign of the apocalypse. Yes. That's a gaming joke of the story, ladies and gentlemen. I may tell later. Success. All right. <laughs> yes. So we got success. So the fishing with the devil story. So I, you know, I didn't really want to write it me in the story because it's pretty boring. But uh, so my story is about uh, Lilum, who's the grand 
daughter of the devil. So okay. I'll read the beginning. The devil came for me early. He knocked once, little more than a tap, before strolling in and announcing breakfast with his usual booming gusto. Bacon and beer a little. Champion, the breakfast of choice for young ladies and chthonic champions. Hmm. My stomach gurgled and I feigned death, head under a pillow, until he laughed and walked away. After a short and unsuccessful attempt to steal more winks, I yawned, pulled a long flannel shirt on, and stumbled down the stairs of the old country lodge, following the <coughs> wafting scent of bacon. The devil put down his morning news, stood up, and greeted me with a warm hug. Good to see you survive the night, he said, picking a speck of link lint from his black silk pajamas, over which he flopped an apron, proclaiming, you can't stand the fire, stay out of the kitchen. <laughs> on the obsidian countertop, an enamel tin plate held a stack of pancakes slathered in maple syrup and butter. Thank heavens, I might survive this after all. The devil dropped three massive slabs of bacon on the edge of the plate and winked. Extra crispy, he said, pulling up a stool and taking a long draft from an ornate black stein. I dove in, hungrier than I thought. Aren't you going to have some, Nono? No, lass. I have this to keep my strength up. He took another pull. Can I get a drink, an orange juice, or maybe a chocolate milk? I could hope. He collected a silver mug from a cupboard, filled it with, from a pony keg on the counter, and slid it under my nose. Bacon and beer, as promised. The smell of brimstone made my eyes water. An infernal stout. It'll put hair in your chest and meat in your bones. You're thin as a rail. What do they feed you up there? I didn't need any hair in my chest. My mother would freak if she found out. But once I got past the screaming soul on the foam head, <laughs> I managed a tentative sip. Not bad. It filled me with warmth and made my face tingle. It's the least I can do. Just don't tell your mother. Now the question of the day. Where shall we fish? Oh, right, the fishing. What are our choices, I asked, with genuine interest. I'd never, I'd never been, and it actually sounded kind of fun. The devil dug up a map and spread it across the island. Let's see, Lost Lake, Purgatory Pools, Revenant Reservoir, the Sea of the Damned. Just how ambitious are you today? I tapped a dark body of water in the furthest corner. It was hidden under a stein, but the blood-red glyphs surrounding it drew my attention. What about that one? He tugged on his ear and moved his mug out of the way. That's the abyss. It's a terrible hole, one of the few places down here not under my control. Oh, Mama Levi and I haven't been on terms since I went fishing with Job. Danger. I felt my skin prickle and my palms grow damp. I was 14 and my mother was still stressed out me crossing the street without supervision. The old man watched my face out of the corner of his eye and nodded. If you insist. I'm not insisting. <coughs> Nonsense. No promises that will catch anything or that will even survive with all our limbs. But I can guarantee it will be an adventure. Without further discussion, we went off to prepare. We got we got we, we got to do we got to do at some point a longer one for you. It's when when's your night, when's your book actually officially coming out? July. July. Yeah. Coffee sometime. We'll go. We'll actually do a we'll actually do a, a, a full proper one for you. All right. Yeah. Is that cool? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Can't wait. All right, man. Thanks very, very much. Robert Bose, ladies and gentlemen. You just stay here. Yeah. You, you, you can. Switch. You, 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 if you want. You Let's can. just, we'll pull the Johnny. Okay. You just switch. <laughs> Some. <laughs> and he runs away anyway. Ah! <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey. He's running too far. <laughs> listen, let, let, oh, let, that's let's, a good runaway. Well, no, let, listen. Oh. In all due respect, Axel, I like you, but I would choose booze over you too. It's, <laughs> it's okay. I would expect no less. Exactly. I mean, we're friends, but we're not that good of friends. So, but anyways. Saying that. <laughs> Once is enough. It was we the, get it. Yeah, it was, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, my next guest is the one and only. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I had a moment there. Anyway, uh, my next guest is actually probably one of the busiest, one of the most talented dudes in the room. Um, he's a writer. He's a publisher. Um, he's a he's an organizer. I mean, he's probably one of the most involved people in the Calgary community. In all seriousness, and you know, it's a real pleasure to have him, Axel Howarth, ladies and gentlemen.
Thank you. Thank you. How you doing, man? Good. How are you? Still nervous, but getting better. Enjoying number 100. Then exactly. 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 Good, good. Yes. So, well, we, it's been not too long ago since we actually did our official podcast there. Not too long. Yeah, a few months. Yeah. So I want to thank you for that once again. We had a really cool conversation. Um, I guess I didn't realize we got along so much with the Ray Bradbury stuff, but I, um, what I wanted to talk about actually with you is Coffin Hall Press. It's that That's your baby, isn't it? That's that's one of my things, yeah. That's one of your things? That's one of my... That's, the main thing right now. It's the main thing right now? <laughs> so so I, I will work with the main thing right now. Sure. Then. Okay, so why did you do Coffin Hall Press? Uh, well, let's see. I'll tell you the whole long, sordid story. <laughs> uh, it started uh, when I first got back into writing fiction back uh, 10 years ago almost. Um, I started out writing horror, and um, I got a job doing slush pile reading as an associate editor for Dark Moon Digest. And through that and with horror writing at the time, things were just kind of starting to boom with the internet and with you know social media. And um, so I knew a lot of horror writers and everybody was kind of bemoaning the fact that there weren't a lot of promotional outlets for horror writing at the time. So I kind of took it upon myself I guess to put something together there was a lot of blog hops and stuff was the new thing but it was almost exclusively for romance writers so we tried to create something for horror writers which we called the coffin hop and the first year we had you know 20 25 people involved second year that ballooned to 100 and the third year that was at like 250 and um, by the fourth year it was just completely out of control but um, when we started out, we wanted to have a nice event where you know everybody cross-promoted. There was a lot of fun. It was a week long leading up to Halloween. And um, everybody would put on special events. Everybody had to do giveaways, multiple giveaways. And we were trying to be a little more creative than just, you know, here's a free ebook. And for the most part, the first couple years, it, it was really amazing. And the, the <coughs> things that people were coming up with were incredible. And we had, you know, art shows and... Uh, poetry slams and things online which nobody else had done at that point um, but then after a while once it got really popular then you know we were kind of inundated with people that just wanted to be able to just pop on the day of it starting and put up a you know paragraph on their blog and push their own book and then not mention anybody else and policing that was really kind of a pain in the ass so <laughs> kind of let that go by the wayside. But uh, in the second year, people started asking about putting together a collection. So I set up um, kind of the framework for an imprint to be able to do that. And we came up with uh, Death by Drive-In, which was, uh, had 22 authors in it, I think. And we had a comic in the back, um, Robot Lincoln versus Zombie Jackson, which was amazing. Um, <laughs> And it was all drive-in and B-horror movie influenced stories um, by, like I say, 22 authors, including Jessica McHugh, and uh, I can't even remember everybody now, but there was a ton of people in it. Uh, it did really well. We did it as a charity book just so we didn't have to go through all the rigmarole of you know, figuring out payments. and um, That did really well. And once I'd done that and gone through the process of learning how to do that, and I had a lot of help from Sirens Call Press with putting out that first book, um, but I had that framework already set up. So when I started getting into more of my own writing after my first novel came out, and I had a bunch of short stories that had been published in different places that were associated with that novel. So I kind of put those together in a, a little mini collection and I started publishing things through Coffin Hot Press. Uh, started with you know some ebook collections. I had a, a zombie novella. I had the uh, assorted hot Sinatra related stories, and then um, some friends of mine in the states, uh, Bob Vardman, uh, Scott S. Phillips, uh, C. Courtney Joyner, some guys that are pretty big in uh, Western fiction, and all also love weird fiction like EC Comics kind of stuff and we decided to do a weird western anthology. So we did Tall Tales of the Weird West, that was a couple years ago and then that same year 
Um, I had the idea because I've been working with the Crime Writers of Canada and I've been working with Calgary Crime Writers and I wanted to do something to kind of um, spark a community here for crime writing <coughs> and I was already working on doing the, the noir at the bars and stuff so um, I set up AB Negative which was uh, 14 Alberta crime writers writing Alberta based crime stories which was amazing. That book came out fantastic. Rob's in that book, as he mentioned. Um, Jane Bernard. Um, Randy McCharles. Is in Randy there. McCharles. Uh, S.G. Wong from Edmonton. Therese Greenwood. There's a bunch of great stuff. Um, S.G. Wong's story was actually shortlisted for the Arthur Ellis Award that year for that story. I believe it. she's really good. Yeah, she's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And we had a lot of amazing people and a lot of amazing stories in that book. And it's still uh, a big seller in a lot of different places in Alberta. And after that, I kind of, you know, I was working on novels, working on other things. Uh, I had my novel Fur come out last year from Taiki Press. And then they want a, a series, which I'm spinning off a series from that. So I've been working on that stuff, but um, slowly but surely trying to get back on top of Coffin Hops. So, um, Rob's book, I really love Rob's work and his story in AB Negative and Fishing with the Devil, which, like I say, was nominated, uh, was a finalist in the Robin Harrington Memorial <coughs> Contest a couple years ago. So I approached Rob about publishing his book, and once we kind of sorted all that out, I actually approached him about becoming a partner, and so we've kind of restructured Coffin Hot Press and... Uh, taken a little more seriously and really ramped things up. So Rob's book, Fishing with the Devil, will be coming out this summer, along with the first in our new Noir Velas series, which is uh, dark crime novellas. And uh, I'm writing the first one of those, which is called Con Morte. And then we've already got three or four lined up. Um, one from uh, a British gentleman named Jack Strange who's done uh, some pretty cool zombie stuff. Uh, we have one potentially from a, a great guy, uh, Craig Garrett, who was in Tall Tales of the Weird West and also was the writer for Robot Zombie versus uh, Robot Lincoln versus Zombie Jackson, which was an incredible webcomic. Um, and then we're uh, planning on doing a, a Norvella every release date that we do in our schedule. We do three release dates a year. Uh, generally July, November, and April. Next April, we have uh, a collection of Canadian women crime writers to celebrate the Year of Publishing Women. Um, that's being edited by Hallie Lowburton and Kat McDonald. And uh, they've got some great stuff lined up for that already. And then beyond that, we're going to do uh, a sequel to Tall Tales of the Weird West for next summer. And uh, we have a Christmas collection coming out this November, um, which has Sarah Johnson, um, who else is in that one? Jessica McHugh, David James Keaton, Will Vaharo, Will the Thrill, Vaharo, um, <clears throat> yeah. Scott S. Phillips, it's gonna be crazy. has a fantastic thing, ties into his Pete Drinker of Blood series, which is like the funniest <laughs> vampire crime series you could possibly imagine. Um, so we've got that coming out this Christmas, which is a weird collection of Christmas stories, uh, which we're calling It's a Weird Winter Wonderland. And we've kind of, are, we're starting to split off where we're going to have a crime line, we're going to have a weird line, we're probably going to set up a horror line, um, then the noir velas on top of that. Um, what did we have? The next Christmas, 2018, we have... Uh, a dark crime Christmas collection, which right now we're calling Baby It's Cold Outside. Uh, that's going to have uh, S.A. Cosby, Rob Sam, Brunet, Sam, Sam Weeb. Uh, a lot of great people already lined up for that one. And then, uh, yeah, who knows what comes after that. Um, there was a science fiction noir collection we'd been working on that kind of fell apart on us last year. Um, we're probably going to pick that up and just loosen up the parameters a little so it's not noir necessarily but science fiction crime mm -hmm. uh, that's probably going to be 2019 okay. uh, 
we've been talking to a few other authors about uh, single author short story collections and who knows we got tons of stuff we could do so all right so i got actually at this point <laughs> two questions just two at this point at, the, at, at this point question one is this what do you enjoy more as are you enjoying the writing and are you doing the all the behind the scenes stuff because it seems like you got a lot on your plate on the behind the scenes yeah stuff. i mean i have this peculiar affliction um it's mostly adhd but it's tempered with ocd and it's uh just kind of a terrifying uh, light speed mental thing um, so I just can't seem to stop doing stuff and I can't seem to say no to doing stuff so you know it just never ends yeah <laughs> but uh, I mean I, I love writing but it's like most writers will probably tell you it's it's a painful process <laughs> to actually sit down and start working on something and then make yourself focus on that thing um i know, know that problem right now yes i gotta like most real writers i've got a day job and i got two kids and you know <laughs> yeah um, you just kind of vanish for like four months <laughs> and or six weeks socially yeah just, i'll just vanish for half I'm, I'm writing this book don't bother me yeah and he vanishes for a couple months and, I, and then he writes the book and yeah. honestly i do that to my family too it's like okay it's sunday i'm gonna go write for a couple hours and then <laughs> you know that's it like five o'clock in the morning and then the next thing i know it's eight o'clock at night you know i i, <laughs> I actually understand that. Like, for me it's it's between december to march i i barely talk to anybody during that time of year it's just like hi I, i'm working on something hi and that's that's pretty much that's 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 me whether it's um because like the, for me this year i i'm almost done a novel i finished my last book on a poetry series i finished a short story i did a comic book I mean that that was all a lot of that was See, that's that. a lot of stuff, man. Yeah, yeah. So and that's that's it. I, I don't get bothered. Then, then around April, I'm like, I probably should have daylight, and I hope I remember to wear pants. That kind of <laughs> stuff. <laughs> all you have to do though is to say, I, I bet you can't edit four books next weekend. And yeah, he'll go. What do you mean? You don't take me? <laughs> that's uh, that's exactly how fur happened. Was I was Psychology. I was at when words collide. And uh, Krista Ball, I was I was at a table mouthing off about romance writers cranking out books in like <laughs> six weeks. Oh. And Krista Ball was sitting there, and she said, "Why couldn't you write a book in six weeks?" And I, I think I'd said something like three weeks or something like, you know, these people are cranking out a book a month; they can't possibly be good. So she dared me to write a book in six weeks, or maybe it was two months. Regardless, she dared me to write the book, and uh, Margaret Corellis from Taiki Books uh, was also sitting there, and she happened to be putting together an ebook collection of um, urban fantasy novels. And I had an idea that had been a short story that I, I kind of finished, but I wasn't happy with it. And so, between the dare and her mentioning this, project that she was working on that she needed in about six weeks <laughs> a-hole that i am i said yeah sure i can do that <laughs> and then I, I so i i cranked that out in six weeks and it went in that ebook collection and i it must have been okay because she liked it enough that she wanted me to expand on it a little bit and then taiki actually gave me a contract for that book which came out last year and um a lot of people say it's you know the best werewolf story they've ever read, which is heartwarming. Yes, the book's not heartwarming, but <laughs> it has um, its moments. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I cranked it out initially in six weeks, but then I took another four months to rewrite it before it came out as a novel. Um, then they liked that so much that the next year at the convention they were saying how much they like particular characters, and I said, yeah, sure, I can write a spinoff story. I can do another book with these two. And then somebody said, well, you know, it really should be a series. And I said, yeah, sure, I could do a series. <laughs> <laughs> so now I now I have a, a five-book series that I have to try and somehow fit, in your fit with Coffin Hop stuff and all the other things. And, um, you know, I have other books I want to write in the Hot Sinatra series and you know, other books that I've already got planned that I haven't started yet. So you're like me, and there are just some days you don't sleep. Yeah, most days I don't actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's part of the affliction. Yeah, so. no, it really, no, it, it is. And then 
I, I, I just give myself like that was like one like day it's like to crash I, I, I may have promised to several people in this room I would take better care of myself and and so there are several and I said and okay and that's on film now yes it is <laughs> <laughs> I'll procrastinate though and I'll spend like all week doing coffin hop stuff and you know I have that day job and I'll do the coffin hop stuff and I know I should be working on the book but I'll just keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off until that deadline is like gnawing at my face. So you're a procrastinator to boot. <laughs> and then and then I'll swat at it a couple of times and I'll go, yeah, fine. And then, you know, another couple of weeks after that, I'll sit down and actually do it. But I don't know. That's, that's my process, I guess. Yes. No, I, 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 I'm, I oddly understand that process. Maybe, maybe I should figure... Uh, we both have problems, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Medication, caffeine. I, ca- caffeine and is yes. I I, I I I I my dad's a herbalist, so I do other weird and wacky things. Well, see, I'm not supposed to mix the medication with the caffeine, but yeah. that seems to be how it works best, which you can mm-hmm. tell by how fast yeah. I speak. But then you throw some whiskey in there. There's a whole there's a whole system. It's like a, a rainbow whole, soup of love. There's a whole system. There's there's a procedure to it that I have to go through. Um, you know, and and then I'll be obsessive about it, so I have to have a certain kind of coffee. I'll go to the co-op that's way up on 85th Street because they have coffee called Ray Bradbury Roast. They really do? They really do. Oh, my God. So I will go <laughs> buy Ray Bradbury Roast just because, you know, it has that tentative connection for me. And and then I'll have to, you know, have that with, you know, you got to have that with the Jamesons, with this and with that. And I got to have everything laid out a certain way, and I got to sit in a certain place, and so you're gonna be one it's of the, a it's a nightmare. When you get old, you're gonna be one of those guys that has a little plastic container with all the little pills in it. Probably, you know, I already so have that. Carry that <laughs> <laughs> I already have that. I got to take like thirty six pills a day, man. Jeez, <laughs> <laughs> just to maintain. How do you get the whiskey in the pills? <laughs> I I soak the pills in the whiskey. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, and, I, and then you sun dry them. Oh. I, 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 and then you roll them up in the lunch meat. <laughs> so that's breakfast and then you smoke it oh okay 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 gotcha gotcha okay so I, I'm sorry I completely lost it but I want the way back to coffee <laughs> so, I'm sorry I'm, 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 I'm I've never seen it in another co-op but the co-op on, on 85th street way the hell up past uh, Coach Hill I they have the Ray Bradbury I, 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 I am gonna go many of the time when go. I have coffee and hop stuff <laughs> Because we usually we give away coffee mugs and stuff like that. We got some stuff to give away tonight because that's what we do. Um, but many's the time I'll go and I'll buy the Ray Bradbury roast and just put a little tiny bag in with the coffee cup and stuff, just because you know. What? Yeah. Fair you got you got to share Ray. Yeah. No. It's it's all it's all it's all about Ray. Now we have to get that uh, new Hellboy. Uh, the Hellboy whiskey. This Hellboy, is true. Uh, this is true. There's a Hellboy yeah, whiskey. Nothing makes me happier than a Hellboy cinnamon. whiskey. There's a Hellboy whiskey. It's gonna be a. Damn. Cinnamon flavored Hellboy whiskey. Yep. I'm in oh, love. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm in love. I think that'll be our new uh, giveaway. Yeah. That, 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 yeah, okay. So that, that, gets me, that has me all the excited. Well, we're not flush enough yet to give away the Suntory Times. So yeah. No, fair, fair enough. We, fair did, enough. we did try to give away a bottle of. Uh, yeah, what was that? The cursed bottle of scotch. <laughs> the uh, Dalwini last year. Right. And we, we brought it to an event here at Owl's Nest, and nobody drank it. Somebody won it as a giveaway, and they didn't want it. They gave it back to us. <laughs> then we tried to give it away at the Noir at the Bar, and it was given back to us again because that person didn't drink alcohol. So that was two events that it got given back to us. So we started drinking it. And then, yeah, we just started drinking it. Fair you, enough. You know where that bottle is? Where, where is it's that in the back, it's right? It's in my house. Oh, it's there. <laughs> I kept it. You, Champagne got it. It's you, empty. You, you would, yeah. you totally would. That, yeah. that, that, that's I totally. Have to keep it. Well, no. she deserved it. She was the she was the grand champion of the. the no, no, but but, but 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 but, but I, know, I know this one too. It's like it was cursed. Let's try. It. <laughs> no, it, it was empty by the time I took it home. But oh, oh, it just okay. Felt like, I'm it's not a prize. Yeah, yeah. You say she earned it because she was the grand champion <laughs> of the when words collide version of the noir at the bar, which is always the big, the big badass version. Oh, okay. And Sarah just destroyed everybody. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't shock me. So you know a little bit on that one. Um, but and last week she read a story uh, at the Rose and Crown about uh, sourdough starter and bakers having sex on the flour. Nice. And half the room was totally, dreadfully offended. 
and the other half, including me, were laughing. Come on, you gotta give me a high five for that. That's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Which is why she was one of the first people that we approached for the Christmas show. (laughs) Why am I not surprised? Because. You know, well, she, she nothing says Christmas like Sarah, like, John- like Sarah Johnson with bakers having sex, like sourdough <laughs> starter and sex on flour. Right? Yes, <laughs> totally. That's, so that's, that's spider sex. And <laughs> okay, we've talked about me enough. <laughs> 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 Moving on. Okay. Sea train masturbation. <laughs> uh, anyway, if, you, if you'd like to learn pants. more, if you'd like to learn more, pick up Sarah Johnson's. Short story collection, <laughs> Suicide Stitch, available She's, now. She has a new book coming out in September. Too. That's true. That's true. Uh, Sarah uh, also has, I'm going to just plug every. Does anybody else have something coming out I can plug? <laughs> <laughs> Josh? Okay, so, uh, for me, two books. Cloud Diver, coming out in August, and September, The Wandering God. Neil Enoch? Kavanaugh Interstellar is online right now, chapter a week. And uh, The Wizard will be October. Second book in mine, hopefully before Christmas. <laughs> Vanessa Cardwee, new album, Patience, coming out September seventh. Did, yeah. did you get all that? Yeah, I, got, it's I a, didn't yeah. see a lot of spikes. I got it back up. You didn't have to go back through. Oh man, yeah, yeah, get yeah. everybody one by one. Uh, probably. I, I'll Make sure there's that. links. I, I, there was a, I, I, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, of- we talked about showing off some covers. Yes. Um, so hopefully, I'll send you some files so you can put up Rob's cover and the Chris the. The cover for the Christmas book, which is amazing, which uh, we got from local legend um, Tom Bagley. Cool. Let me just uh, pull it up here to show the crowd. <coughs> You'll have to describe it in detail for our listeners. Indeed. All, all I have to say is Tom Bagley. And if you don't know, get the video. I, is that a thing still? <laughs> yes. <laughs> by the freaking video man. Thanks. <laughs> it is not for long Yes. Forbidden mention, vi- forbidden yes. mention uh, album. Yeah. yeah. But 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 I think what we should do is we should get to the part where you actually read something. All right. Okay. Yeah, all right. We Hang should on. get we should get to that part. Hang on. I got the cover here to show. But you it does see. remind me what, what yeah, first show, show the show the world. Show you guys. Yeah. All right. Ooh. That's awesome. Tom Bagley. So, and he's going to be redoing all of our weird <laughs> line. It's terrifying. It's fantastic. It's terrifying. That's, well, that's something we want to do, too, with Coffin Hot Presses. Again. We want to work so, with... So, correction. It's adorable. So true. We want to work with <laughs> indie artists, indie writers, and just kind of promote art on a whole. Kind of like what I do on the podcast? Yeah. 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 Cool. So, Yeah. Yeah. But, it's not, there's but you want me to read something? I, I, no, yeah, something from you. All right. Yeah, take something. Uh, this is uh, the, the novella that I'm working on, which will be the first novella in the Noir Vela line. Uh, it's called Con Morte. It's um, definitely noir. A lot of the time we try and focus on noir stuff, and people don't understand what noir actually means. So we get a lot of detective stuff, and we get a lot of you know robot assassin stuff, and... Things that aren't really noir. It should be dark and nihilist and everybody making the wrong choices and the wrong decisions and everything that could go wrong goes wrong. And much like Fur, this one kind of starts out very noir and then there's some little redemptive stuff, but it still turns out really terribly. So, And horrifically violent. I'm in. (laughs) (laughs) This part's not so violent, but... Uh, let me see. Yeah, all right. <clears throat> the Boyd girls lived on 42nd Street. I remember the little gray townhouses with their angular patio fences and open yards. I hadn't been up in this neck of the woods in, what, 20 years? Which is surprising considering my line of work. Still, it was an odd thought to pop into my head thinking about two girls I'd known in high school, two sisters who'd taken a shine, or maybe it was pity, on a weird orphan kid with no friends. I lived in a foster home about 20 blocks east. I don't even remember their names, the people I lived with, I mean. They sure as shit don't remember mine. I mean, I, I slept there, ate breakfast there a few times a week. I went to school, I had two jobs. I did my best to stay off as much radar as possible. But I remember skulking around in those open yards way too early in the morning. 
throwing rocks at the Boyd girls' windows like some idiot in a bad teen movie. Really, I was just kind of addicted to being in their midst. They were all very nonchalant about me being around. I just came and went, and they would just accept me. They let me play on game night. They let me stay for dinner on Taco Tuesday. Their mom was a nurse. She wasn't around much, but when she was, she called me Jackson. I don't know why. It's not my name. My name's just Jack. Jack Nada. Means nothing. But she gave me a nickname. Nobody had ever given me a nickname before. Carmine calls me Jackie Nobody. I just prefer Jack. Their dad was cool. I, I liked him more than I liked the two girls, really. He was a smart man. We enjoyed the same books. He gave me a copy of James Joyce's Dubliners. He thought he should inscribe it, so he wrote my name, followed by a comma. He showed me how to rebuild an engine when I helped him restore his vintage Triumph motorcycle in the summer before our graduating year. I hadn't seen any of them since. I, I wondered if he still lived there. Tommy. No. Terry. Terry Boyd. His daughters were studious, smart. They were in every club, every activity. You know, from drama to singing to the choir. From Model UN to lacrosse. They were popular simply by virtue of their omnipresence. But Terry seemed to me to be very alone in that house full of high-achieving women. They were quick and active and had never-ending lists of appointments and commitments, social requirements, future plans. They never stopped moving or planning or achieving. Terry, Terry was like me, and I didn't know too many people like me. Growing up in orphanages and foster homes, I mean, I, I knew a lot of quiet kids, but they were quiet and sad, longing for something they felt was missing broken and depressed. But Terry Boyd wasn't sad. He wasn't happy either. He, he had a life, a job, a wife, two good-looking and talented daughters that were destined to rule the world. Terry should have been happy, or at least content, but Terry was like me. Like a black hole walking through the world, a ghost inside a suit of skin. There was no happy, no sad. There was just time. Ever ticking minutes to be filled, jobs to be done, tasks to be completed, rules to be followed. Back then, they didn't really have a name for it. Quiet, reserved, distant, shy, uncomfortable. Those are the kinds of words people used to describe Terry Boyd. Odd, sometimes weird or strange. Still seems better than the words they use for me now. The doctors that Carmine sends me to, they, they like to discuss my place on their charts and their curves, spectrums. Autistic, Asperger's, antisocial, a lot of A words. Then there's the really good ones like clinical detachment, sociopath. I think I'd rather just be weird and shy like Terry Boyd, who <laughs> read Joyce and fixed a motorcycle that he never rode. It was just a thing to fill the time, a job to do, a task to complete. Some of those people, those doctors, they say I shouldn't be around other people. Some of them say I just need routine. Some of them said I just needed to focus on things to fill the time. Some of them were right. The banging from behind me muffled and dull puts an end to my reverie. There's a Chilean crack dealer named Manuel Ortega in my trunk. I shit you not. <laughs> That's what you say, right? When something's so funny that people might not believe it? I shit you not. I saw that in a movie. This is my task right now. This is my thing to fill the time. Manuel is kicking at the inside of the lid, screaming from behind the wide strip of duct tape I wrapped three times around his head. It has unicorns on it, little pink cartoon unicorns. I shit you not. <laughs> Manuel is a bad man, like, like every other piece of chattering meat that Carmine sends me to deal with. Mostly drug dealers, bookies, hard cases, guys that carry knives in their socks or hide box cutters in the crack of their ass. They, nobody's, they know somebody's coming for them sooner or later. They just hope it isn't me. Oh, yeah. There you go. So that's Con Morte. That'll be out uh, July from Coffin Hot Press. All right. So people want to find you. How can they do so? Uh, look for Axel How, A-X-E-L-H-O-W. You can hashtag that shit or put the little A in front of it. Uh, that should put you next to me facebook twitter instagram wherever very cool thank you very much man 
Or uh, go to Coffin Hop Press, coffinhop.com, to find out more about all the Coffin Hop Press books. Actually, I probably will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> so, so I when I had this idea of doing the 100th episode, the, the, the idea I had was initially a talk show format. And I always was thinking of a talk show format. Every talk show either had, ends the show with a comedian or a musical guest. And I remember our conversation back, like for the longest time, my conversation with Vanessa Cardaway was the most popular episode I've ever done. Um, and I think one of the reasons why it works so well was we had a really good back and forth, not just with ourselves, but with the people around us. We had that conversation at When Words Collide and the waitress and a few other people were as part of that conversation. You can listen to it on my YouTube channel um, as at this point in time as it's archived now. But for the longest time, her episode was the most popular. And I thought, to close out the 100th episode, um, she's no longer the most popular, but at the time I asked her, why as well have my most popular guest close out the show? So without further ado, Miss Vanessa Cardaway. Hi, Josh. Thanks for having me back. Oh, I <laughs> thank you for coming back after all this time. So... so Congratulations. I know you don't want to uh, hear that. No, uh, no, don't mm. congratulate me yet. I, go, go, uh, on, go on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Three al your, thir your third full length album. It depends on where you start counting, I suppose. But as yes. An, as an independent artist, it, I should say. As, as, a, as a solo. So, in a way, I consider it my second album because the last one I did, Philip and Cookies, was a novelty album. This is the second album I'm releasing as a solo artist of my heartfelt personal material. And it's called Patience. And I called it Patience because I was naming it after the cardinal virtue of an artist. And uh, to, to, uh, to acknowledge how long it had taken me to get to the point in my life where I could even conceive of such a project. And then it took me three years longer than planned. <laughs> so, it uh, happens. But, but, uh, but here it is coming. It's, uh, it's coming out September 7th of this year. So I'm, I'm very, very happy to have announced that recently. Yeah, like you look like you have a weight off your back because I because we we, we would talk so? oh, it would it would talk it would no because when we when we would talk like because I remember a couple times I ran into I've run into you off and on um, I would talk because I I finished my series right my my first my first series series as an author and we were both like approaching the end at the same time almost and it was like you you went to me I remember you asked me once you struggle with endings too it's like yeah it's 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 hard to let go. It really, really is. And as an artist, because you always, listen, this is just speaking from my end. Um, I always find it's really hard because you, you know you can make it better. And, and, and if you give it enough time and enough place, um, you, you, you might find a better way to tell that story, a better way to sing that song. But at some point, you have to move on and let go. And uh, that for me, that's, that's kind of how it feels like with me. I don't know if it's, it's like the same <laughs> battle with you. Well... What you said is perfectly true, but I think no matter how good it was, even if I thought I couldn't make it any better, it would still be painful to end. Uh, and it's not something that I fully understand yet. I'm still trying to understand it. My, uh, I, I have a fear of completing any project, big or small, and this is the biggest project I've ever done. So the fear is really overwhelming. Uh, that's understand that <laughs> but bit, by, like. by the way congratulations on your 100th episode yes never thought i'd do one no alone 100 and here i am <laughs> but so uh, but uh no i i uh from my end it, it just yeah i i said this at the beginning it's just shocking that so many people have come on the show um and like i said it, and, and flattering that people come back i must be doing something right. oh it's fun yeah. it's so much fun talking to you you make it easy oh thank you but um the, the the weather outside is evil frightful, frightful. thank yeah. you yeah. and it, and it makes me want to sing yeah. uh, who here has read Moby Dick one person two people three four okay a few of you have that's wonderful now you know what everyone should read Moby Dick but it's a very big commitment uh, and uh, so you guys are all my new best friends and um, <coughs> so in, in chapter 122 of Moby Dick, it's the shortest chapter in the book, and uh, it, uh, it 
is a scene where this character named Tashtigo is up in the crow's nest during a storm. And he's very unhappy to be in the crow's nest during a storm. And uh, the opening track of my new album that's coming out September 7th is called Chapter 122, and it's based on Tashtigo in the Crow's Nest, upset about the storm and the fact that he has no rum. So I want to sing it right now because there is a storm outside and we have rum. We do. Yeah, it's actually it's a very hopeful ending to the story that, that, that we have rum. Why is all that It's yet. not. It's here. It's not gone yet. Yes, <laughs> there's more back there. So, But I need your help. This is a song that requires audience participation. So, I wonder if you can handle this. It goes, um, um, um. Um, um, um. Good. And you can also sort of let it flow together, like, um, um, um. Um, um, um. Easy. Okay, so what I need you to do is, um, um, um. Wait, two, three, four. Um, um, um. And keep that going. Stop that thunder. Plenty too much thunder up here. What's the use of thunder? We don't want thunder, we want rum, rum, rum. Give us a glass of rum. Stop that thunder. Plenty too much thunder up here. What's the use of thunder? We don't want thunder, we want rum, rum, rum. Give us a glass of rum. Stop that thunder. Plenty too much thunder up here. What's the use of thunder? We don't want thunder, we want rum. Give us a glass of rum. Rum, rum, rum. Stop that thunder. Plenty too much thunder up here. What's the use of thunder? Stop that thunder. Give us a glass of rum. Give us a glass of rum. Thank you. You're all good sports. You did a good job. Yeah, you, know, you are a very good performer. You really, really are. You actually have a very, Thank you, Josh. You, you have a very good. You, I again, I, I so I, how I met her. So I, I, I do open mics because I once upon a time when I published my very first book of poetry way, way, way back in the day when I first lived in Calgary, I would I didn't know how to promote my stuff. So I would do open mics. I would go up there and I would actually just spout poems. So I went to Wentworth's Collide open mic, and then I actually had to follow her, and I, I was like. What do I? What am I doing here? <laughs> By the way, I'm at every when words collide open mic. It's my thing. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, uh, well, I, I host it actually. I have every year since I was a guest of honor there. The uh, second year that when words collide ran. And, and and on a personal, every everybody that actually, whether you sing, whether you read, whatever you do, should go there once. Last year, Randy McCharles tore the house down at the very mm, end. Yeah. Yeah. So, but. Um, but it's it's a cool thing, and that's how I met you. And, I, and then even then, when I watched you, it was like you're a very good performer. Like you, you're some, like I I've been, I, don't, I don't think I've really asked this before. How long have you actually been on the stage in some form or another? Oh, um, since I was a little kid, uh, my my parents are both very accomplished musicians, and I grew up in a music studio. So when I was a little kid, uh, my parents were both music teachers as well as performers, and they also contracted other teachers to come and teach in our home so between about uh, three o'clock and seven o'clock every day uh, there were music lessons going on in every room of our house so it was a it was a music filled home and that's when I started doing recitals and other kinds of public performances um, but I, I look back very fondly on a couple of particular performances when I was 12, when I was starting to perform my original music. And uh, 
and then when I, w when I turned 18 in 2004 is when I started going with gusto because it's a lot easier to perform when you're 18. You can perform in bars and, and so on. And I was with a band called Hero Incredible at the time. So like I was just watching the clock till I turned 18 and bam, I started performing in every club I could. Wow. So, so, it, so like I said, you've been doing this wow for a long, long time. So uh, does, 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 I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very. I want, I don't want to ask the age question because you might punch me. I'm, but that's I, it. I'm 30. You're 30. Yes. That's okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm still older than you if it makes you feel better, so. No, I love being 30. Yeah. It's the best age I've ever been. Uh, well, actually, truthfully, when you get, when you break, when you break 30, you're a lot more comfortable with who you are. I, I've, I've noticed that so yeah. far. Yeah, you're a lot more, you're a lot more comfortable. With, I, I found like when I got like 20, I was a wild, like a wild mess. I didn't know who the hell I was. And, oh, 20 sucked. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 30, 30, on the other hand, you're like, I'm at peace now. And, and I mean, I mean, it's a weird, it's a weird, it's a nice Zen thing. I mean, I, I mean, I, I know I am perfectly content where I grew up, and now I'm like, and now it's about, now it's about trying to be a better person for me, and that's, and I find that, and some days I win, some days I lose, um, but I, at least I, it's easier for me to acknowledge when I lose, and I, I find that's, I think the best thing about getting older for me is, and so, but um, back to back to the uh, stage thing. Is there like a particular performance you remember, in, like like yourself that 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 you really in, like? Because you get a rush doing a crowd. Yeah. Crowd. Uh, well, there have been a lot of good performances. You have to yeah. give me no more to go with. Um, where 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 like you felt like you like owned the crowd because I I know oh ooh, be, because because there's a, there's there's there are points I know with with where you're like you have the crowd they're paying attention they're listening and it's like okay yeah we like what you're doing and then there's like moments of crowd they they are into everything you're doing and that is probably the best high you could probably have yeah absolutely um and and, and I love it and I've I've had uh, I've had my fair share probably the best performance I've ever had to date was the uh, the CD release party for Thought Experiment, my album that I released back in 2011. And a lot of work went into making that concert happen. And also, right up until it did happen, there was a lot of stress. Uh, the <sighs> The PA system wasn't working right, and sound check was a horror show, and it was all just mess <laughs> after mess, and then finally everything was good. And by that time, you know, I was I was running around like, like with blinders on, trying to solve problems. And then when I was finally ready for the show to begin, I I kind of I got on stage and I looked up and I saw that the place was full. It was completely full of people who were totally silent and looking at me. And so, you know, they had been coming in while I was busy stressing out about the sound and about a few other things. And then all of a sudden, all right, this is beginning. And look at all these people. Uh, this was at um, the National Music Center. Now, the National Music Center is in a new building now. But at the time, it was the old uh, Cantos Museum, mm -hmm. which had a beautiful little venue. Not very big, a capacity of about 150 but it was full and it was just gorgeous. And in that moment, I realized that this was gonna be very special even though it was just <laughs> an uphill battle getting there. And that concert was probably the best I've ever done to date. To date. Yeah. You gonna top it this year? That's my plan. That's your plan. So, yeah. so the release party, you should actually talk about that a little bit. Okay, yes, um, so I've just I just announced a few days ago that the release party is going to be September 7th and I'm having it at the Calgary Hellenic Community Hall which is the Greek Cultural Center and the uh, I don't know if any of you have seen it but the stage looks like a temple facade it's, it's a Greek temple on the stage itself and the walls are lined with pillars and it's just the most beautiful thing it's all in white and blue and it's going to be absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the staff there have been lovely to work with, getting it organized. And uh, I am inviting a lot of musicians to join me on the stage because this album, more than any I've done before, has involved a lot of different people putting their creative stamp on my work. So every musician that 
was on the album has been invited to be part of the concert. Most excitingly, uh, there's this uh, violinist named Sonia Shklarov. She's one of my best friends in the world. I see her about once a year because she moved away right after high school and I, you know, she, she's been moving around in different cities and she now has her master's degree in violin and is currently living in, uh, in Winnipeg playing symphony gigs. But once a year she comes and she sees me and she asks me, so what are you working on? Can I help? I just love her for it. Uh, but uh, she, this time, for the first time ever, she will be in town for a gig of mine and she'll be on stage with me doing the parts that she did in studio with me on Patience, which is so exciting for me. I'm, I'm just I'm thrilled about that. But there are also a number of other fine musicians will be joining us and bringing to life on the stage what I've recently been able to do in studio. So I got one last question then yeah. about that, and it's this. So white and blue. I noticed with your album stuff, there's a lot of white and blue there. Is that mm -hmm. was that was that um, like a, like a one of those like synchronicity things, or was that by design? Like in terms of the the, the stage? venue, yeah. Oh yeah, that was complete coincidence. Yeah. Um, it's so funny. So it's called the Hellenic Community Center because Hellenic, if any of you don't know, it, it just means Greek. Uh, it's the Greek cultural center. It's connect, connected to the Greek Orthodox Church. And um, my mom happened to be in the neighborhood, and she took a picture of it. And she took a picture of the outside that said Hellenic Community Center because I'm a Hellenist. So that's, that's what I call myself. That's my religion. I worship the gods of ancient Greek. Ancient Greece. Sorry. Rum. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so my mother saw this building and took a picture of it and sent it to me. And I thought, okay, well, that's really cool. Uh, it's, it's not about Hellenism. It's, it's just Greek. It's the Greek Community Center. But I've never been there. I should go check it out since I'm researching venues for my CD release. I wonder what this venue is like. And I went inside and I almost fell to my knees when I saw this stage and this, uh, the hall, which is a, it's, a, it's a gym. You know, it's a community school, this building. So it's a gym, but also a hall. You know how uh, most of us went to high school in large buildings that had the gym with a stage at the back. Yeah. Except this particular stage has this amazing temple facade built around it. And it I could not have asked for a more perfect venue. So the... Um, that sounds actually very fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, like it, it's a brilliant coincidence. Yeah. And, and of course, the color scheme. It, it matches what I had going with, uh, with the album art. Uh, I've got this amazing blue, like Renaissance dress, and all this, uh, all these seashells, and a big anchor that I'm dragging around. I'm very excited about this. I don't know if you can tell. Well, that no, but you I, should be. I mean, you, I, no, I mean, you busted your, you busted your ass on this. I mean, yes. I, I mean, look, I, I, I haven't gotten to the end of the show where I talk about my stuff, but I'm, I'm jacked to doing the, doing the things that I'm doing, and I, you've been what four, three, four years longer. At this point? Well, it depends on where you count it from, like I said before. Uh, but I did a successful Kickstarter in November of 2013, and I raised $10,345. And then I said I would have it done in a year. And so I am almost three years overdue, regrettably, but, well, not regrettably, because so much has happened in that time that has made it possible for me to make this project the very best I could. And so, you know, I'm always one to set goals that I know I can never reach, even though I try my damnedest. I really did try to have it done in a year, but it's been four. Uh, I, I used the money from my supporters who believed in me to not only make the best album I could, but also pay my people. There is a, a tradition amongst musicians within a community that we work together a lot based on favors. And what I wanted to do differently for this album is I wanted to pay my people what they were worth instead of based on some sort of future thing I could do for them. And so I, I could have done this album on a smaller budget easily but I chose to pay my people. And that was a big 
part of the mandate that I set forth when I made my Kickstarter it, campaign. It's funny because for me, um, the Wandering God, I I met this. I worked with her. I like one of those weird coincidences of fates. I used to work at a Kinkos in North Hill Mall. It's now called In Source, and this and I worked with two people that were really talented. One of them was working on me on the cloud, and the other one was working with me, the Wandering God. I met her years later. Um, I had a chance to work with one of my heroes, and a lot of people know this story person that know me personally, but. While I love, like, from a creative standpoint and from a personal standpoint, I really enjoyed my time. But this is the first time in my life I worked for somebody that could not fulfill their end of the bargain, and I paid a huge price for that. And I have <laughs> always, in my head, no matter who I work for now or who I work with, if I say I'm going to do something, I do it. Because I know what it's like to have, like, like, like personally, I have problems with, like, a different point. But the thing is, I always value... Anybody I work with, I try if I I try to pay, because mm-hmm. I, I, I I find I find with me it's just it's not because um, I don't always have to in some cases, mm-hmm. but it's more for me be the fact that I appreciate what you do for me and yes. the fact that you don't have to do this for me and the fact that you put this much effort and time and you made my work better just being there and I can't I can't. Um, I can't put a value, to be honest with you, I can't pay anyone what that's worth. Mm. But what I can do is pay them something to show them my appreciation for yes. that work. Money is certainly not the only way to compensate someone for the work no. that they do for you. However, it is an unambiguous way yeah. to compensate someone. So there is a beauty in that. There is a beauty in paying a fellow artist for their work and saying, well, you know, uh, in a couple months I'm gonna do a job for you and you're gonna pay me that money again back <laughs> you know so so it's a it, it puts it puts a sort of um, standard on that uh, that interaction between people <laughs> that that's how I see it uh, yeah. and I I have been let down and I have let people down and I want to go forward not doing that anymore I, I wanted to change my framework and being able to pay my people was part of that for me. No, no, it's good. The only thing I'll tell you, just from my own experience, you will be late sometimes because shit happens. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah, no, no. I mean, I mean, I just this, but, but you will be late. But the, but the, a Kickstarter I backed up. Uh, a Kickstarter I backed up. Um, they 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 were really late too. But unlike what you did, because I saw what you did, um, they never communicated the reasons for the delays, and the project mm. just disappeared into obscurity. I would rather someone make a mistake, own up to a mistake. And then just okay, or have life happen. Tell me what's going on. Because mm-hmm. as long as you're communicating with people, people will give you a chance, even if you are late. Things happen. So yeah. yeah. Well, my experience was um, whenever I was talking to like many many of my Kickstarter backers were personal friends, not all, but many. And if I would talk to those people, and they would ask me, "So how's it?" going? How's the album? And I would go, oh, God, it's taking so long. And and invariably, <laughs> they would make some sort of joke about, oh, well, I'm being patient, awaiting patience. Oh, God. <laughs> Which is so funny because, I mean, it's a very obvious joke, but when I named, I named the project for a completely other reason, and so it really seems quite right that it turned out that way. Definitely, it definitely, definitely a lesson and made a little bit of irony in there yes. for sure. I think we should probably wrap the interview up. So, how do you want to do this? Do you want to sing another song? Do you want to plug? I'd love to sing a song. Uh, all right, your call, whatever you want. Okay, I have to get my uh, guitar. It's on the other side of okay. you. Okay, and while you yeah. do that, I will go grab what I'm going to read and get the closer things out. Ooh, okay. Yes. All right, so I will. Uh, I will sing another song from that album, which is called Go From Hence. And uh, this is my very best pirate song. And it's about the downfall of Black Bart Roberts. So Bartholomew Roberts was the most successful pirate during the so-called golden age of piracy. He captured over 400 ships in four years and then was caught by the Royal Navy and was killed in battle very early on and when uh, when he was seen to have fallen his crew all surrendered even though it meant simply walking to the gallows and uh, I, I read about that story in a classic work of uh, of history from the 18th century called the 
general history of the robberies and murders of the most notorious pirates by Captain Charles Johnson. And then I wrote this, and it's one of the best tracks on my new CD, which I hope you will all hear soon. <laughs> But showed after all Our hands were down But fears for the sober Fighting drunks The best way to fall Though we swore We'd never surrender But as one Goes straight down to hell Shot was fired And down went the captain Strike, he's dead And down came the mast Go from hence to the place From whence you came from thence to the place of execution where below the flood marks you shall be hanged by the neck so you are dead god have mercy on the souls <laughs> From driftwood and stone Descendants running wild to Madagascar Born as rogues and rogues till they die I regret that shot to the powder Burned my flesh but left me alive Take one more minute. Sure, you take one more minute. Because I have a song. It's one minute long. Okay. I call it just a minute. Okay. Because it's only one minute long. Yeah, you just do your one minute song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I'm shuffling my feet and seem nervous, don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. If I'm biting my lip and stuttering, color me charmed, completely disarmed. I'm just trying to say. In my eloquent way That getting to see you has made my day And I hope this feeling never goes away I don't want to take up too much of your valuable time Valuable time And I hope you don't mind if I can't make it perfectly rhyme All of the time but what I mean to say, that is, if I may, and the last thing I want is to scare you away. Ba 
that I love you and I hope that that's okay. Thank you. So all that stuff relates to close things up. I, I would be remiss after Vanessa, Axel, and Robert got out of their way to actually put something up that I wouldn't read something to. Before I close with this, I want to thank Robert, I want to thank Axel, I want to thank Vanessa for coming out here, braving the storm. I really appreciate it. I want to thank everybody here that attended the show. Thank you very, very much. Don't worry, once we read this, we can have cake, I promise. But, um, but everybody's talking about what's coming next. What's coming next for me, I don't know for sure when the Cloud Diver's coming out. I want to say August, but there's there are... Putting a novel together is a lot different than a poetry collection, and uh, it's been an educational process. I've had a lot of fun. I actually should tell this story real quick. It's because of her that the, the unicorns, F.R. Trainbows, is in this novel. So I'm going to tell that story real quick. So what happened was my sister goes to me, because what are you writing about? And I told her about the idea about the cloud is archaeology, and she goes to me, could you put a unicorn in it? And the thing was, I already had a framework for it. So I'm like, yeah, I can do that. You can't kill it. <laughs> I said, well shit <laughs> and she's like please and she's my sister so it's like okay fine I won't kill the thing fortunately I came up with a really brilliant solution if he was here tonight Adam Dries would uh, play a part because actually he was the solution um, I'll, I'll let you in on, on that another day so but I don't know when that's coming out uh, Rachel, thank you very much for the unicorn. So, um, but The Wandering God, I do know, is coming out September 15th, 2017. Kirstie and Mirabel Books is the last book in my series. Um, all things come to an end. And for me, I accidentally wrote the first book, and it's been a very interesting journey. And I've grown as a writer and everything else I seem, I seem to be doing these days. Um, but I thought this was a good way to close it out. The this poem is a chapter in the book. It's called The Glass Cage. All things considered, I prefer bars. They are more honest than this. There is no illusions, no pretensions. You are caged. Simple, succinct, humane. Here there are no bars, just glass and white floors. You can see freedom, an inch away, all around you. It's maddening. I want to scream. How like I did in the City of Dragons. But this is different. We are watched all the time. Men in uniform surround us, study us, question us in their strange tongues. They are afraid. They fear we are an enemy. In my journey as I face that fear, the rock people, the dragons, we are used to being strangers. This fear from them is different from mine. These men in uniforms are tense, alert, ready to act at a moment's notice. Have they ever seen the outside world? Have they dared to look around them? Or have they been caged in the city all their lives? Was it any different than I was? What I had been like until I saw there was more? I was cold, isolated, lonely, afraid. Because I knew I was small. I am just a tiny piece of a larger whole. I didn't need to do more, know anything but my place in it. Now I really am small. I've seen greater worlds than these. I've seen fire out of a mountain. I went through mist and storm, even the empty behind us. I am smaller than I ever was, yet I no longer resent it. I want more to see, to discover, to grow. <coughs> My anger dissipates. I feel pity, how small they are, and not know it. I tap the glass and harder than bars and sigh. The revelation is a comfort, but I'm still a prisoner here. What will they do to us? I look at my fellow captives. I sigh. Nothing to do but wait. We, watch the, we just watch these strange people, watching us, watching them, without any trace of fear at all. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the podcast. Thank you very, very much.